Now I want to introduce also as we're talking about fields right here, the idea of a skew field or sometimes called a division ring. Uh, because as we've seen in group theory, commutivity is not required for inverses. Um, to, to have multiplicative inverses, you do have to have a multiplicative identity. So unity is required. You need a ring with unity. But you don't need commutivity. So if you have a ring with unity that satisfies the multiplicative inverse axiom, every element except for zero has an inverse, we call this a division ring or a skew field. The idea of skew field is that the prefix skew often suggests commutivity. Uh, uh, that is non-commutivity. So there's some type of twist when you do the multiplication. Now a skew field could be commutative or could not be commutative. The thing is we're not assuming anything about commutivity. So fields are examples of division rings because in a division ring, we have a well-established addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. The, 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 the difference of course though is in a skew field or in a division ring, we don't assume that multiplication is commutative, which also makes division sort of an interesting thing as well, because you get a left division versus a right division. Uh, but but we won't worry about that so much right here. Uh, so like the rational numbers, the real numbers, the complex numbers, all examples are of commutative division rings. So I think it, it it's worth entertaining. Is there an example of a non-commutative a skew field of some kind. Well, it can be difficult to come up with examples because you can actually prove that there's no such thing as a non-commutative finite skew field. That is every finite division ring is an, actually a field. Uh, but let me give you an example of an infinite one. And this is gonna be based upon the quaternion group that we studied previously in this lecture series. So the quaternion group, uh, which you'll recall, consists of eight elements, uh, plus or minus one, plus or minus i, plus or minus j, and plus or minus k. And we can identify these eight elements with, with matrices in the general linear group of two by two complex matrices. Well, the general linear group of these two by two complex matrices is a subset, it's a subset of the ring of two by two complex matrices. And this here is a ring, first of all, but it's also a vector space. If we think of it as a complex vector space, since it's two by two matrices, we'll get a four dimensional uh, vector space. But as every complex number Z can be written as A plus BI, uh, where A and B are both real numbers, we can actually think of every complex number, that is the complex number field itself, is this two dimensional vector space. And so the two by two uh, complex matrix ring forms an eight dimensional real vector space. And so what we're going to do is we're going to construct the, the subspace of two by two complex matrices spanned by these four matrices. All right. Uh, so we're going to, we're going to take the span as a real vector space of the matrix one, I, J, and K. Now notice we don't need to include minus one, minus I, minus J, minus K, because as the span takes all linear combinations, we have negative one times each and every one of those things. So if we take the span of the quaternion group, we get the so-called quaternion ring. So this is often referred to as the ring of quaternions. Sometimes people call it the Hamiltonian ring, uh, named after, of course, Hamilton, who, who uh, first discovered the quaternion group in the first place. He was so excited about it, he vandalized the bridge uh, with his discovery of, of the quaternions. All right. So the quaternion group forms a spanning set for this subspace. So it's going to be a subspace, which means it'll be closed under addition and it'll be closed under scalar multiplication, which just means multiplication by a real number. But what's the multiplication of this, of this ring? Well, it turns out that because we can, we know how to multiply together these quaternion elements, um, it's just going to be the same multiplication of the complex matrices in play. And you can show that in fact, this is a sub ring of M two by two C. That is this, this subspace H is in fact closed under multiplication. Um, and it's going to be a non-commutative multiplication, uh, which M two by two of C is non-commutative, but a subset actually could be commutative. The issue here is that H here contains the quaternion group as a multiplicative closed subset, which that subset is non-commutative. It's a non-abelian group. So this subring is going to be non-commutative. So this gives us a non-commutative ring with unity. It does contain the identity. Um, I claim though that it is in fact also a division ring, which we'll talk about how we do the inverse of an element in just a second. Uh, but I want to give you a slightly different perspective how one could think of the quaternions here. Um, you could also think of the quaternions as an extension of the complex field. Uh, because the reason why we call this symbol a lowercase i is we could think of it as this 
complex matrix, yes, but we could also think about also as the complex unit uh, in C, so the square root of negative one. Um, but what we're saying is here is that in addition to the usual complex square root of negative one, we add in two quaternion complexes, uh, uh, excuse me, two quaternion square roots of negative one. So these are distinct square roots of negative one that are not additive inverses of each other, uh, i, j, and k, in which they multiply together by the usual rules of the quaternion group. So i times j is k, j times i is negative k, j times k is i, etc. Um, and so as a quaternion, right, you have a number like a plus bi plus uh, cj plus dk, where a, B, a, B, C, D are real numbers, you can think of a quaternion as a generalization of a complex number because complex numbers are just those quaternions whose J and K parts are zero. And so we can extend the notion of the complex conjugate in the following way. If we take a quaternion bar, that is A plus B, I plus C, J plus D, K, if you take the conjugate of that, this, you'll just switch the sign of the non-real parts. So you'll switch the sign of the imaginary part, I, also the J part and the K part in the, in the quaternions there. And so then in terms of addition, you just combine like terms, subtraction, same thing, multiplication, you just foil these things out. Again, that multiplication um, just extends that of the complex numbers. Again, we can represent that inside this quaternion, uh, inside this matrix ring if we still wanted to. But the division, let's get to the division. How is this a skew field, a non-commutative skew, skew field? Well, if I can tell you what the inverse of an element is, then we can do division because division is just multiplication by an inverse. So the inverse of a generic quaternion, which it should look like a reciprocal one over the fraction. What we're gonna do is like we did with complex numbers, if you wanna compute the reciprocal, just take the reciprocal and then top, times the top and bottom by the conjugate of the reciprocal. And then what you can then see is that the numerator, you're gonna get one times the conjugate. So the numerator is just gonna be the conjugate. The denominator is the fascinating part. When you multiply out the denominator, you're gonna end up with uh, this element right here, you get a sum of squares. And how does that happen? Well, when you do the possible FOIL here, you're gonna get an A squared, you're going to get uh, a negative ABI, you're gonna get a negative ACJ, and you're gonna get a negative ADK, that's the first round. Then the second round, what you're gonna get is you're gonna get an ABI, I'm gonna write that here actually, you're gonna get a, you're gonna get a BI, you're gonna get a negative B squared I squared, all right, so I'm gonna put that over here. You're gonna get a negative B squared I squared. Uh, next, you're gonna get a negative, you're gonna get a negative uh, B C I J. And then next, you're gonna get a negative B D K I, like so. Uh, then if we do the next one, C J, when you distribute it through, you're gonna end up with a, uh, a negative, no, actually, excuse me, positive A C J. Next, you're going to get a negative B, C, B, C, J, I. This thing's non-commutative, the order matters here. Next, you're going to get a negative C squared, C squared, J squared. I should have written I squared earlier. And then lastly, you get C, J times negative D, K. So you're gonna get a negative C, D, J, K. Uh, like so, I haven't done that one yet, so I'll put that here, negative CD, JK. And then for the last one, you distribute the DK through, you're gonna end up with an ADK, positive ADK. Then we're going to get a negative BDKI, a negative BDKI. Uh, How did I get an, a KI earlier? That should have been an IK, sorry about that. The order does matter on these things. Um, then we should get a DK times a negative CJ. So that's gonna be a negative, a negative CDJ, uh, K, KJ, like so. And then lastly, we're gonna get a negative, a negative D squared K squared. So there's a lot of stuff to do there here. A lot of stuff to do there, but notice how it simplifies out, right? You, some of them are pretty easy. You get a negative ABI plus ABI to cancel. A negative ACJ cancels. Uh, the negative ADK cancels with the positive one. So those are all gone. But then look at these ones. These ones differ only by the terms IJ and JI, right? Which 
Ji is the same thing as negative Ij, so this actually become a positive Bc Ij, so they cancel. Same thing here, Ki is the same thing as negative uh, Ik. So these terms are gonna cancel. And then Kj, remember, it's the same thing as a negative Jk. So those will cancel. So everyone canceled off except for this term right here and this term right here. But notice I squared, J squared, and K squared, these are all complex, uh, excuse me, quaternion square roots of negative one. So in the end, this will turn out to be A squared. Uh, then you're gonna get a plus B squared, plus a C squared, plus a D squared, thus giving us what we needed in order to get these units. Uh, that is to say that we get multiplicative inverses for any quaternion number.